For decades, these murder cases have faced a tough battle against the unstoppable march of time. Held back by a significant obstacle that has made them unsolvable until recently. But now, let's dive into four cases that have suddenly come alive with fresh possibilities for resolution. These victims have spent decades without their identities revealed, but they've recently been identified. This not only brings closure to the families, but also sparks hope of finding the culprits responsible for these terrible crimes. Let's get into it. Case number three, Woodland Jane Doe. On September 12, 1976, the serenity of Woodlawn, Baltimore was shattered by horrific discovery. On Dogwood Road close to the Lorraine Park Cemetery, pedestrian going about their mourning found the body of a young woman wrapped in a sheet. Shocked at what they discovered, they soon called the Baltimore County Police Department to the scene. When police arrived, they determined the young girl's head had been wrapped in two bandanas and a grass seed bag. It was evident to investigators that the young girl had been strangled to death, and the autopsy would later show seeds in her throat, which is believed to have contributed to her passing. The girl had also been sexually assaulted before being dumped near the cemetery. Her hands had been crudely tied behind her back with cloth and a rope. At the autopsy, the young woman's body revealed a frightening clue. Chlorpromazine. This medication is a sedative. At the time, it had been used to treat schizophrenia. According to reports, a large amount of the drug was found in her system, which signaled to police that she'd been drugged, assaulted, and strangled. The person responsible had likely given her the drug to subdue her before launching the attack. In the report, the medical examiner noted that the girl was likely between the ages of 15 and 30 years old, possibly white or Hispanic, with brown, wavy hair and brown eyes. Despite the initial shock and outcry that the case garnered, no one stepped forward to identify her, leading investigators to call her the Woodland Jane Doe. In news reports, the police noted that the girl's teeth were in excellent condition, and she also had a crudely done tattoo on her right arm. The tattoo was believed to have been the initials JP, JS, JD, JB, SP, SS, SD, or SB. The seed sack that covered her head read Farm Bureau Grass Seed, Lexington, Massachusetts, and was traced back to a Buffalo, New York manufacturer. According to the manufacturer, this seed bag was only sold in five places across Massachusetts, considerably narrowing down the police's field of view. Despite having such a telling clue on their hands, investigators failed to learn anything more about their victim. In late 1976, the Woodland Jane Doe was laid to rest in an unmarked grave. Years would pass before the case would pick up speed again. In 2015, when investigators received information that pointed to the Woodland Jane Doe being of Puerto Rican or Colombian descent, the tipster claimed that they believed that Woodland Jane Doe had moved from either of these countries to Boston, Massachusetts, more specifically the area of Jamaica Plain. This clue tied into a crude tattoo found on the young woman, but that lead eventually fizzled out. In 2021, the Baltimore County Police Department announced that they were working with Authorm Labs to uncover the mystery of Woodland Jane Doe once and for all. Using genetic genealogy and other forensic methods, Authorm discovered that the body found in 1976 belonged to 16-year-old Margaret Federoff of Alexandria, Virginia. Her family last saw Margaret in Alexandria in mid-1975 before she vanished into thin air. A missing person report had been filed, but investigators in different counties and states had failed to connect the dots. Margaret's body was found just 53 miles away from where she disappeared, a year after she had been reported missing. There are some speculations that Margaret may have been taken from Alexandria and put into some sort of human trafficking operation, which may be the source of the tattoo. She had been alive for a year from the time she had disappeared until her murder. Her brother is asking anyone who knew Margaret to come forward with any information they may have. They are looking for anyone who knew Margaret in 1975 or anyone who met her while she had been missing. The question of who killed Margaret is still being explored. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Baltimore County Police Department at 410-333-3254, quoting case number 1054031. 
Case number two, Adam Doe. This is kind of a connected update to a case we previously covered nearly two years ago. On October 18, 1983, a middle-aged couple was out gathering mushrooms in Lake Village, Indiana, when they came across an abandoned farm. There, they discovered several shallow graves that contained the bodies of four deceased young men who had been drugged and stabbed. Two of the men were quickly able to be identified as Michael Bauer and John Bartlett, but the identities of the two other men remained a mystery. They soon became known as Brad Doe and Adam Doe of the Newton County John Doe's. While it would take years for the John Doe's to be identified, it didn't take as long to identify their murderer, serial killer Larry Eiler. Also known as the Highway Killer, Eiler was already in police custody as a suspect for a series of murders when the four bodies on the farm had been discovered. Eiler died in prison in 1994 from an AIDS-related complication while on death row for the murders of 15-year-old Danny Bridges. A posthumous confession, it was revealed that Eiler had murdered at least 21 young men that he'd picked up hitchhiking. Years passed without any successful leads on either John Doe's identity. Then in 2021, after 37 years, the Newton County Coroner's Office was finally able to identify Brad Doe by his true name, John Ingram Brandenburg Jr. John had gone missing from Chicago, Illinois in 1983 and was 19 years old at the time of his death. The last time his family saw him, he was leaving their home to visit a friend. Now it was Adam Doe's turn to be identified. He was described as a young black male between 15 and 18 years old. He had died between 1982 and 1983. Using the same methods to identify John, experts turned to genetic genealogy and the DNA Doe project stepped in to help. In July 2023, Adam Doe was officially identified as 16-year-old Keith Lavelle Bibbs, who had been from Chicago originally. Before Eiler's death, he had been able to recall several details about Keith's abduction, but not his identity. He said that he had picked up Keith, who had been hitchhiking outside Terre Haute, Indiana. The family has not revealed much information about Keith, as they are extremely private, but they did allow Keith's remains to be returned to Chicago, where they held a funeral for him with the family and the investigations who'd worked his case over four decades. Case number one. The Im Lay Jane Doe. On October 26, 1978, the Pershing County Sheriff's Office in Nevada received a call to come out to the Scosa Road, close to the town of Imlay, Nevada. When law enforcement arrived, they were greeted by a grisly scene. The remains of a badly decomposed adult female had been discovered stuffed into a garment bag. After dumping her so callously, her killer had dug a shallow grave and left her there to be discovered. Her body was transported to the medical examiner's office, where they hoped that her bones would garner more information. The medical examiner determined that the remains belonged to a middle-aged woman with red or auburn hair and was 5'5". Five five. Due to the state of her remains, a cause of death could not be determined, and it was marked as a homicide due to the circumstances in which she was found. Investigators had one last hope, her clothing. She was found wearing a dark green three-quarter length jacket with a white metallic safety pin attached, dark green pants with a long pink heavy sweater with a short-sleeved pullover type t-shirt and cotton underwear. Unfortunately, the case quickly went cold, and a crude reconstruction of her face had been made and circulated around the state. However, no one recognized her. And as the years passed, technologies advanced, 
investigators created a digital reconstruction of her face and submitted her dental records. Her records didn't match any known missing person and investigators felt as though they were stuck in a limbo. Several decades would pass without a word in the Imlay Jane Doe case. That was until March 2022, when the Pershing County Sheriff's Office reached out to Othram Labs. The Imlay Jane Doe's remains were sent off to Othram for genetic genealogy testing, and within months, they were able to find a match. In March 2023, Othram and the Pershing County Sheriff's Office held a joint press conference in which they identified the Imlay Jane Doe as Florence Charleston of Portland, Oregon. According to reports, Florence had spent most of her life in Cleveland, Ohio, and had moved to Portland shortly before she had died. Florence was in her late 60s, possibly around 68 when she died, and both investigators and her family remained baffled as to how she ended up in Nevada. As of November 2023, no suspects have been made public, and Florence's case remains stone cold. Case number four, Trunk Lady Doe. It was a late afternoon on Halloween day in 1969, when two young boys saw something unusual while playing in a field in St. Petersburg, Florida. The boys watched as two older men in a truck dumped a black steamer trunk in a wooded area of 34th Street South close to what used to be the Oyster Bar and the conjoined parking lot. After the men got back into their vehicle and drove away, the boys flagged down two officers who were on their routine patrols. Intrigued, officers approached the trunk with caution, unaware of what they were about to discover. As the two opened the trunk, they were greeted with horrific sight. Inside the trunk lay a woman wrapped in a large plastic bag, naked aside from a bloodied pajama top. It was clear that the woman had suffered several blunt force traumas to the head, and a men's western-style bolo tie was still wrapped tightly around her neck. Shocked at what they had discovered, the officers ran to their car and immediately called for backup. Within the hour, the once quiet and serene St. Petersburg countryside was swarming with police officers. The woman's body was transferred to the District 6 Medical Examiner's Office, which determined she was white, 25 to 35 years old, 5 foot 9, 130 pounds, with brown or black hair and brown eyes. The medical examiner also determined that she'd given birth at least once in her life and had suffered from gallbladder issues. The woman's teeth were also said to be distinctive, with a small partial upper plate and several teeth missing. A copy of the woman's dental impressions was circulated to dentists around the area, but no one recognized them. Likewise, no one in St. Petersburg recognized the woman when an approximation sketch was distributed to local news outlets. Once the initial buzz of the case died down, the mystery of the trunk lady eventually went cold. Investigators traced the trunk that she had been found in to the non-breakable trunk company. This vital piece of evidence yielded little clues, and the trunk lady was buried in an unmarked grave in St. Petersburg Memorial Park Cemetery. Every so often, investigators would pull her case file, hoping to uncover some new evidence, but the case inevitably sat cold. In 2010, with the passage of time and advancements in forensic science, the trunk lady was exhumed for further testing. Isotope testing revealed that the woman had likely hailed from the southeastern U.S. and was not a Florida native. Moreover, she had spent several years in northern U.S. before she'd been murdered. Samples of her hair and teeth were sent for DNA testing, however, they were deemed too degraded. In an incredible stroke of luck, Detective Wally Pavelski in the St. Petersburg Cold Case Unit found hair and skin samples that had been taken from the trunk lady's first autopsy in 1969. These samples had been perfectly preserved and were sent to Othram in Texas for genetic genealogy testing. Using these tests and records, Othram managed to trace the woman's family tree, and fortunately for them, a now adult close relative was also searching for the same woman. In May 2023, Othram and the St. Petersburg Police Department held a press conference in which they announced the trunk lady had been identified as 41-year-old Sylvia June Atherton of Tucson, Arizona. It had been Sylvia's daughter, Sylvan Gates, who had been searching for her mother and had been the one to put forward her DNA in hopes of finding some answers. 
Sillin had said that she had been nine the last time she saw her mother. She stated that her father had custody over her and her 11-year-old brother, and that she'd gone over to see her one day in Tucson, Arizona, and discovered that her mother had moved, packing the home seemingly overnight and leaving suddenly. She had been told that her mother had moved with her new husband, Stuart Brown, along with her five-year-old sister, Kimberly Ann Brown, an older sister, Donna Lindhurst, and her brother-in-law and Donna's husband, David Lindhurst. Donna was 20 years old, and it was believed that she and David were relocating to Chicago. The couple also had a small child as well. It was unclear why the family had up and moved so suddenly. And after they left, no one heard from Sylvia again. This adds to my interest, of course, of my mother disappearing, but of finding those, my two sisters. How has it been through those decades not knowing where your mother was and then to receive that phone call to get a finality of it? Well, it was shocking because um, it had been so many years and we, we had no idea what happened to her. Uh, she did leave with another brother that she left in Chicago, as the officer mentioned, uh, just about six months after they left Arizona. And so he came back uh, to Tucson. But we thought we would hear from them at some time, but you know, life goes on. I was young and growing up and I tried a few times to try to find her, but there was just nothing. It had gone cold. So um, it is a relief, a sad relief to find, that finally found her. And she was, you know, of course, this terrible way to die just a few years after she left the state, so. Have you heard about this case prior to learning that this was in fact your mother? Never, and it was so shocking. We, met, we had no idea, none whatsoever. The whole family, my brothers, two, two brothers, were, were shocked. It's, it's a big surprise, but it, 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 it's a comfort. Well, you wonder why she never tried to contact us in all these years. You would think, gosh, she would have tried to reach out or, or something. And, and I went on Ancestry in hopes to locating two sisters, uh, figuring my mother, because of age, probably would have passed by then. Um, so we've been trying to find a, a sister that was only four or five years older than my older sister these many years, thinking Ancestry would help. What did happen is we found another brother that my mother had. That she had it's quite a story in itself. Uh, and he knew he would be, had been put up for adoption. It was in between having older children and then right before she had us. So it's a very, very strange story. My mother's, my mother's life was <laughs> quite, quite strange. You mentioned that uh, your older sister had a husband and another and a child. Have they, yes. are, is there any contact with them or are they also unable to be found? Unable to be found, and that's what's so curious is uh, my brother got a call back around 68 or 69 from the St. Petersburg, Florida area, which was my sister, but she just left a message with a grandparent. She thought he'd been killed in the, the Vietnam War. This is such a tangled web. I don't know how deep to get into this, but he, she found out that he wasn't dead, so I know she was in the St. Petersburg, Florida area at that time. That's, all, that's the only time we've ever heard of that area. Um, but what's surprising is why didn't she report my mother, my mother's missing, or or what happened to the bait, the little, my younger sister, who was only four at the time, what, what happened to her? Both of them, we've not heard from any of them. And now as investigators are asking for anybody to share additional information on this case and their new findings, what's your hope through all of that? Yeah, of course, uh, I think number one is, is we would like the, the case to be solved. You know, we'd like to find out who did this. Also to find my sisters. I mean, the younger one was only four years old. I mean, it's, of course, we're concerned that what's happened to them, because why haven't they reached out? I went on Ancestry years ago when Ancestry, Ancestry allowed this type of information. And another brother, we went on it right away in hopes that we could find, find them. It was the only way we could, <clears throat> excuse me, try to find them. So that's my hopes is maybe this gets out, maybe they'll hear and maybe we can locate them. Cillin recognized the trunk when shown evidence from her mother's case and said that her mother had used this as a TV stand and had been one of the items of furniture that had been taken when the family moved. 
According to reports, the cohort left Tucson for Chicago, Illinois, and Sophia's movements thereafter remain unknown. It's also unclear if any of them had ever made it to Chicago, because Sillen had to believe that Donna and David had ended up in Florida. Stuart Brown passed away in 1999 in Las Vegas, Nevada, where he'd been living for decades, and according to records, he had never filed any documents saying that he'd ever been married or had children. Brown had never reported his wife or daughter missing. As of October 2023, Sylvia's case remains unsolved. However, Sillen is still hopeful of reunited with her sister, Kimberly, who would be around 60 years old today. Or Donna, who, if she was still alive, would be in her 80s. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Wally Pawalski of the St. Petersburg Cold Case Unit at 728-893-4823. So what are your thoughts on these cases? Which one do you think is most likely to be solved? Let me know in that comment section down below. And if you see anything you want me to cover next, let me know. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. I'll see you on the next video. Stay safe out there. Goodbye.